Weird things happening today and today. We've got the uh, bugs in. Hi, Paul Wheels, IT North. How are you doing? Great to have you online today. Great to see you. We've got a number of people already online. If you'd like to chat to us. <laughs> yeah. All right, I think I found out what the problem was. That's what happens when you leave YouTube on in the background. Um, good evening, welcome. Uh, I'm going to bring John in to save the day. John, how are you doing, mate? Save me. Uh, really good. Yeah, I've uh, had a fantastic few months playing with my satellite equipment that uh, the lovely people at Canaia sent uh, sent to me. So they're going to tell us all about their constellation satellites and the things it can do. And then I'm going to follow up with uh, uh, my experience and uh, developing on their platform. Awesome. Looking forward to this. Um, it's uh, it, actually done. We haven't done a show with uh, Satellite Connective yet, have we? In the how many years have I uh, IT North? So uh, it is our birthday this this month, um, and I believe we are now four or five years old. Is um, starting as IoT Newcastle. How old is IoT Leeds? Uh, which uh, you 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 came from? Uh, I wasn't the founder. Probably about three or four years. Yeah. Um, so um, so this is great. One I haven't had um, as part of IoT Newcastle or IoT North any satellite conversation, so this is this is really exciting. Um, I'm gonna. Uh, I do need to make a statement uh, as my employer that any comments or feelings or opinions that I have are mine and mine alone, and not those of my employer, which is Intel these days. Um, if you'd like to know about Intel uh, software or anything, get in touch, and I'm more than happy to chat with you about it um, offline. We do. We are planning some shows later in the year from those guys. Um, if you'd like to say hi, please do. Uh, we, and as uh, all the regulars will know, if you have any questions, comments, by all means, fire them to us and um, in the comments on whichever stream you're on, be it on Twitter, LinkedIn, or um, or uh, YouTube. Um, let's bring in Remy and Guillaume. Hi, guys. How are you? Hi. Hello, Paul. Hello, Paul. Hello, Hello John. John. And happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah, uh, we should have a cake. I might go to your presentation or nothing. They want to see the presentation. Um, hey, guys, I'm going to open the floor to you and let you fire ahead. Um, as I said, um, if any of the viewers have any comments, questions, or anything, um, by all means, um, say hi where this has just popped up, um, which will just come up and we'll pop it up on the screen and we can ask questions. Uh, we can show you questions and show you comments there as well. And I'm going to bring in your presentation. And by all means, guys, please fire away. So I'll start away by maybe presenting myself. I'm very pleased to be here tonight. I'm Remy Ferry. I'm the Chief Product Officer at Kinis. I'm here with Guillaume. Hi. Um, I'm working in the sales department of Kinis and uh, I'm, uh, I manage the partnerships and sales. And I've been in discussion with IoT North some months ago and we decided to organize this uh, special webinar. So as I said, we're very happy to be here, uh, here for your birthday apparently. And so as a, as a gift, I have a special presentation for you about uh, Kinis uh, satellite connectivity. And uh, I'll walk you through uh, this journey with, uh, with Guillaume. So as a, as a start, uh, today we'll walk you through what is Kinase, um, what are the use cases that can be addressed uh, by our revolutionary uh, new satellite connectivity, walk you through some of our products and, and how to go through integration. And then we'll have a, a John testify as uh, someone who went through this, uh, this journey. So what is Kinase? Who is Kinase? First of all, Kinase is a satellite operator. You can see on the right a picture of the satellite that will be launching next year. I'll be coming back on this uh, in a second. So Kinase is a satellite operator. We operate seven satellites today, uh, providing connectivity through uh, already 20,000 devices on the ground. Um, this is coming from the, the heritage uh, of uh, the Argos system that some of you might or might not know was used uh, 30 years ago to, to track uh, polar bears, uh, birds, uh, fishing vessels, uh, and all kind of scientific applications. Uh, today, we, we're developing uh, this connectivity dedicated through, through IoT and, and small object to satellites um, by launching a new constellation of 25 nanosatellites. Uh, 
as it was on the previous slide. You can see satellites are like this. They're basically a big shoebox. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Guillaume can, has the, the small version. Uh, 20 centimeter by 20 by 40. Uh, so this is really small, it's like 25 kilos. And we'll be launching those, those birds uh, next year. So it will be fully, fully operational. Um, so we, we have uh, raised uh, 100 million uh, two years ago uh, to finance the, the whole infrastructure. We're launching the satellite. We're building the ground infrastructure, uh, the ground station all around the world to receive the data from the satellite. And when we have uh, our, our facilities, our data, data center uh, to, to compute and, uh, the data and then transmit it uh, to all our customers. So um, this is the space part. We operate the satellite and then we provide connectivity. We're, we're a connectivity operator. Um, we provide two-way communication uh, with uh, small messages, uh, up to 30 byte typical size of the messages. Um, thanks to our uh, phased constellation, five planes of five satellites that orbit regularly around the Earth, we can provide a coverage uh, um, up to one message every 15 minutes. Every 15 minutes, you get a satellite pass over your head so you can transmit. Um, this is um, uh, using uh, frequencies in UHF, 400 megahertz, so uh, it's pretty low, so it, it has a good uh, link budget to reach the satellite. This allows for very low consumption. Uh, we'll be uh, uh, using 100 milliwatt, 200 milliwatt uh, power consumption to, to reach the satellite, so this is really almost close to, to what is possible on the ground with terrestrial network. And um, this frequency also allows us to have uh, quite small devices on the ground uh, that can be easily integrated in, into uh, connected objects. Our, our value proposition and how we, how we stand compared to terrestrial and old space uh, operator, I'd say we're trying really to bridge the gap in terms of hardware pricing, in terms of service pricing, and in terms of uh, global coverage between what's possible on the ground that's very dependent on the infrastructure that's been deployed or not, and uh, satellite uh, geo or, or iridium uh, networks that are still uh, pretty high in, in power consumption and in size and, and in price of the hardware and the service. Uh, compared to terrestrial uh, operator where we stand, um, we consider ourselves as very complementary to LoRa, Sigfox networks, uh, to a certain extent also of NB-IoT. Um, we don't want to replace, for example, a LoRa network. If there's a LoRa network, then, then it's probably better to use it. Uh, it has better uh, power consumption, but then when you go out of this lower network, then there is there is no solution, and then uh, then here comes uh, uh, Kines, and this is where we we believe a lot in in hybrid devices um, to fulfill the, this kind of uh, uh, use cases. So this allows us to to reach a battery life uh, of a few years, uh, very close to what can be done in, in the uh, in the terrestrial IoT, uh, and in price. Uh, talking about the prices, uh, our goal is that the, the end connected devices device can be under 50 euro with a module under 20 euro uh, and the connectivity a few euro per month, also always depending on how many messages on the use case and, and, and the commitment and the volume. So uh, just to, to give you a, a rough order of magnitude. Uh, I'll, I'll hand it to Guillaume uh, for a brief presentation of all our use cases that are possible with this connectivity. Yeah, thank you, Remy. Um, so we try to present in this section what can be the main use cases of the Kinis technology for the use cases that you may have with your clients or your, your partners. Um, so first of all, I will try to present what are the main pain points that we address because there are so many communication protocols in the Internet of Things that it's really important to understand when you can use uh, satellite IoT connectivity and more specifically uh, the Kinis connectivity. So the first pain point that we address is to uh, get and to send data from static assets that will be deployed in remote areas. When we talk about remote areas, it can be from mountains, it can be from the oceans, or it can be in some 
uh, rural part of countries like France, you can send and uh, operate uh, IoT devices uh, in really remote uh, areas. It's always important to remember that only 15% of surface Earth is covered by terrestrial communication. So the satellite and the hybridation with those technology is crucial if you want to provide a, a better level of service. Um, the second pain point that we is also a key for our technology is to provide a continuous coverage, more especially when uh, you will need to do asset tracking glo globally without having to manage roaming issues. So this pain point is something that we that is quite relevant for logistic companies, but also for um, I will say companies that have operation worldwide and that need to track and to monitor their shipment or their assets. The third one is to have a cheap and reliable uh, alerting system. So it can be to protect people. It can be also to protect your valuable assets. So this is uh, for this pain point, what we will do, for example, to develop uh, beacon distress for uh, hiking people, for fishermen or anything else. And this is also where the bidirectionality of our system is really interesting. And the last pain point uh, that we address is to get a backup connectivity. So it can be a backup connectivity plus uh, IoT terrestrial communication, or it can be also uh, plus uh, Wi-Fi. The idea is to have a connectivity that will uh, be, I will say, a warranty if anything happens, if there is a disaster, uh, if there is no electrical network, and some companies for valuable assets uh, use satellite communication. Something important to keep in mind is that uh, you need to link it with the main, uh, I will say, features of our technology uh, with system that can work on battery with a low energy consumption and at a low price with a global coverage. So this is the main difference of what we propose compared to, I will say, legacy satellite system. Um, we also try in the, in the next slide to present uh, what can be the main market verticals. So there are other market verticals that we address with our technology, but mainly you can find in, uh, in this slide the main uh, market that we address. The first one is our legacy business because we are a spin-off of the French Space Agency and it's science and environment. When we say science and environment, it's to help um, uh, scientific or to help government to get data to monitor uh, the, the environment. The second market is all that will be linked with humanitarian projects for NGO. Uh, maritime industry is, of course, a big candidate for the Kines technology. It can be for uh, vessel tracking or for vessel monitoring. And also the smart agriculture, because uh, in, I will say, the majority of the case, uh, the landscape will be uh, in areas with poor terrestrial coverage. So the Kines connectivity can bring value to the farmers. And after, we have other market verticals. Um, I uh, already mentioned what we can do for uh, uh, ICAR or for the uh, uh, people that will uh, practice uh, outdoor activities. And you can also use the Kines con connectivity to monitor network and infrastructures and for transport and logistics. Uh, something important, we already talked about it, but uh, the, the use case of Kines will be for uh, when you when you are in an outdoor coverage, for indoor coverage, uh, other communication protocols will be more adapted. So on the on the next slide, we try to um, to present what can be uh, the main use cases in the different market verticals. So uh, for the science and environment, it can be the main use case that we have is to track and to monitor wildlife. So you can see on the right uh, that this is a kinase based device uh, that is used to track and to monitor uh, wild spaces. It can be also to uh, measure some key parameters like water, air, or soil quality. And also uh, the idea is really to have uh, devices that can operate in harsh and isolated environment and that can send data for scientific and, uh, and government. Uh, other products can be, for example, ocean buoys or small weather station. Uh, the next uh, the next big use case for Kinis, so the market vertical is transport and logistics. So uh, in, the, in this market, we will address uh, big logistic companies or large companies that we need to have a global view on their shipment. Uh, the idea is really to have a solution that will uh, enable to have an international uh, vision of where is your device without having to manage uh, roaming issues. 
Uh, and something important is that this solution is not only to do asset tracking. Uh, our connectivity can also be used to do some uh, cold chain management, for example, and to send some alerts if anything uh, anything won't happen. Uh, and the last uh, topic can be, for example, for fleet management. So if you have a large fleet, uh, you can decide to connect uh, your different vehicles with satellite connectivity. So we already discussed about uh, smart agriculture, so I will try to be quick on this uh, specific market vertical. But there are a lot of different use cases that can be covered by satellite IoT connectivity. It can be to track and to monitor your machinery, or it can be to track or to monitor your livestock. Uh, and it can be also to uh, do some storage um, monitoring conditions, so to be sure that the level of uh, uh, humidity, the temperature is, is, is okay. And it's also important to know when you can um, when you need to manage your resources for example for fuel for water a lot of companies in canada in the us or in latin america are deploying uh, level monitoring sensors to know exactly when they will need to fill their their water tanks or their fuel tanks so this is a big uh, also a, a big market vertical for the kinis connectivity um, the humanitarian projects so there are uh, different uh, the use cases that are covered in humanitarian projects are closely linked with what we presented. So it can be to track and to monitor the convoys. It can be also to have a distress beacon for local population in case of attack or also to, uh, uh, to send alerts when people are sick. Uh, and it can be also to monitor equipment that will be deployed in harsh environment, for example, for genset that will be deployed in the, in the desert, for, for example. And the last one is for the maritime industry. So, of course, satellite is the perfect technology for the communication uh, when you will need to send data from the oceans or from the seas. So the idea is really here to track and to send data from your container. Uh, you know that uh, container tracking and monitoring is a big use case for the IoT. Uh, one other key uh, element can be also for the fishing vessels. Uh, we equip for governments, uh, uh, for regulatory bodies, bodies a lot of fishing vessels uh, to be sure that they operate uh, in an area that is, uh, that is, um, I would say, uh, important and that will not be uh, outside of the authorized uh, coverage. And it can also be used to send some alerts to the fishing vessels. For example, if there is a, a weather alert, they can use these devices to get the data from the from the uh, weather uh, weather body. So these are the main, I would say, market and uh, uh, market vertical and use cases that can be answered using our technology. There are a lot of other ones, but uh, this is to give you a first idea of what you can do with uh, satellite IoT. Um, and yeah, smart infrastructure, uh, we discussed about it uh, quickly in the beginning. So it will be mainly for tank monitoring and also to do some utilities uh, monitoring, but it will be really dedicated to isolated areas uh, because uh, we are not focusing smart city. Uh, we are not focusing utilities uh, in the cities because the technology is not adapted for that. But for example, uh, we have some ongoing projects uh, to connect uh, utilities in uh, Australia or in Canada uh, to get data from uh, isolated uh, farm uh, for the utilities aspects. So now you must be wondering, how do, how do I start? How do I integrate this in, in a new device? Um, so I'll walk you through what a, a smooth integration uh, should look like and, and what do we provide uh, to, to help you uh, in this journey. Um, so basically what, what we sell, Kinis doesn't make the end device. Uh, we build the components, the basic electronic components uh, that are to be used to connect to the satellite and we um, accompany our, all our ecosystem of device manufacturers and, and service resellers uh, so that they will address uh, the, the end customer. Um, so we, we supply two versions, a chipset and a module, a chipset being uh, the lightest version without power amplification and filtering and, and all the, the radio electronic that needs to be added. Uh, obviously, this comes with some complexity to integrate, so we also uh, providing uh, a module version uh, who, who has uh, who manages the intelligence, who manages the message formatting, uh, and who is really uh, plug and play, uh, I'd say, modem as you would expect uh, from a telecommunication modem. 
Um, and this module today, uh, we have a, a transmit only uh, version and we'll, we'll be uh, supplying a transmit and receive a module in the coming months. Uh, all our, our equipments, chipset or module, come on evaluation boards for a quick and easy integration. Uh, they come in various flavor. Uh, John here has been using the, the Arduino and, and STM32 uh, uh, compatible board. We're also providing a Mongo H or mini PCI uh, boards uh, that also help uh, speed up the process for prototyping. And uh, we're also um, proposing uh, demo devices, uh, our own demo device, uh, and uh, our ecosystem uh, already uh, built an industrialized product uh, that can be used uh, as a demo product. Uh, how does a, a normal journey, I'd say, start to become part of our ecosystem? Uh, usually comes with a discovery pack, uh, like uh, our, either our space priority program or Kine shuttle program. This comes with hardware then in unlimited uh, connectivity for a certain period of time, S access to all our documentation and support. We have a, a team of experts at, at Kineis uh, for software, hardware, uh, antenna design, uh, and it comes with access to our demo platform uh, in both cases. Once this step is completed, let's say, and, and, and our partner move uh, more into product design and industrialization. Uh, then we supply uh, our, our, our component chipset modules uh, in, uh, in industrial packaging uh, and support to go through uh, large scale uh, productions. And then there's a, a contractual discussion about the connectivity and then pricing for, for this. All along this journey, we support you through technical support. Uh, as I mentioned, we we provide um, uh, examples of integration. We provide schematics. We provide we provide uh, reference designs for for antenna for those who want to integrate the antenna in their design. Uh, there's a question. I'll answer this. Uh, what is the maximum interest speed? Uh, so we don't supply Wi-Fi in in rural area. Uh, our connectivity is uh, very small messages, thirty bytes messages. So this doesn't really compare to Wi-Fi. Uh, in the case of uh, Wi-Fi wi in rural area, this was mentioned as a backup connectivity. Let's say your asset is usually connected in Wi-Fi, and then you want to know when the Wi-Fi is out, and then you you can send the alert uh, through through our satellite connectivity, for example. Um, so the second second support obviously is commercial support because um, there's a lot of education to do about uh, IoT to satellite. So we we try to uh, address a, a large uh, a large customers and provide access to our ecosystem to those customers and help them uh, educate on how to use and how to really uh, take the best out of the technology. Uh, we're working on collaborative projects. Uh, mostly with European uh, funds or, or national funds, uh, trying to build really strong partnerships uh, and, and gather financing when there's a need uh, to, to kickstart projects, for example. And then obviously marketing and communication to, to put uh, in the spotlight all the projects and all the products that ha have worked well and, and really serve the market. And something important, Remy, maybe is that Today, we have uh, around 50 integrators that are developing solutions uh, based on the Kines connectivity, and uh, they are developing solutions on the different market verticals that we present just, uh, just before. Yeah, exactly. And um, we, see, um, we see a lot of, um, a lot of use cases where, in fact, our, our existing partners have developed the product and then we can showcase this to to all the clients that we are we are prospecting, uh, and most of the time this is how our ecosystem also gets new leads uh, for the for their products. Um, and last uh, last slide um, on on the how we we accompany you to the journey of developing a, a Kinase device. Uh, there's obviously the first tech discovery first step. Uh, discovery program and, and hands-on evaluation kit is what I mentioned. Uh, for hardware and software integration, we go 
quite far into providing um, uh, open source uh, designs, open source libraries and, and uh, antenna reference designs. Um, this is something we we invested a lot of time into uh, to, to be able to provide the best solution for different um, uh, integration possible. So we, we provide different form factor, for example, for the antenna. And we also um, help uh, the, the device manufacturer in the transmission strategy optimization, uh, thinking of how it will work with the satellite uh, using the satellite pass prediction algorithm and everything. We, um, when the devices uh, are to move in, into production and more into industrialization, uh, then we also help uh, in the validation uh, phase. Uh, we support you through the test campaigns uh, and provide tools that uh, are, are not yet available online, but that we have access to to explain how, how really to interpret the performances uh, that are observed. Uh, our first module is uh, comes a pre-certified. It can work on our network, but it can uh, it's a C, it has already the C marking in FCC. Uh, so this is uh, uh, very helpful for you, for integrators once they they want to uh, certify the, the the end product and they don't have that many steps uh, to go through, uh, especially on the the radio side. Uh, and then we provide some testing tools uh, to go along uh, when they they reach uh, production testing. And sales marketing, uh, we have our product uh, catalog, as, as, as I mentioned, kind of a marketplace. Um, and we, we provide a qualified business opportunity when, when there are new ones. Quick illustration of our module. Uh, this is a two by three centimeter and the 500 milliamp. Uh, today, this will, uh, this will be optimized once we have the, the final constellation uh, uh, launched. Uh, it's a very simple uh, UART 80 command interface. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, it, uh, it comes mounted on, on various boards for prototyping and, and already has uh, API libraries. Uh, first, last thing I want to insist on, we have a very um, open strategy. Um, we, we have existing uh, device manufacturers that started from scratch uh, from our modulation specification. They built their own device and they just went to us uh, for certification. This is something we allow on our network. Um, this allows for more flexibility to build a new device, but it also has some costs. So we also provide uh, the basic component, the module. Um, and um, we're, we're very engaged into this uh, uh, open source and open open hardware, for example, uh, initiative. So we, we we want to supply to our ecosystem all the the, the, the reference designs and the schematics uh, for for the best uh, chipset and module integration possible. John, uh, I'll hand it to you for the testimony. Thank you very much, uh, Remy. Thank you. Graham. This is why I said, can you see my slides? No one responded, so I take it you can't see my slides. Yes, we can see them. OK, great. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry about that. Right. Um, Uh, so, yeah, my name is John Stavely. Uh, I run, I work for IoT North, uh, organising all the meetups. I don't have any association with Canaeus, um, other than the fact the lovely people there sent me uh, this bit of hardware that I could play with. Um, my day job is a, a software engineer uh, and I organise uh, IoT North. Um, so I, I received the device, I've been, this is my side project for about three months now. Um, and what I'll cover tonight in my presentation is what my objectives were and how the objectives really just drove everything else I did. Um, obviously, your use case might be different to mine, so you might need to take a different route through this. 
so from my objectives that then drove out a transmission strategy how i wanted to interact and communicate with the satellites and um, which then necessitated calculating the passes of the satellites overhead because a lot of the time they're not there so if you it's not like tcpip if something doesn't respond you you know about it you're beaming a message into outer space and then uh, nothing tells you whether it's been received or not so then from that that drove the hardware setup and some things about the telemetry i'm capturing my software setup uh, and then some of the tools that canadians give you in terms of their web portal how i then process data in integrating with their data center my data center and then some of the testing scenarios i had and some of the results so my use case, uh, which may be different to other people's, was that I wanted to uh, capture a counter. So every 15 minutes, I would take a temperature and then just count up. And this way, I could see how many of the messages uh, I would uh, would be able to get through to my data center. So I could measure that, mess that transmission and reception efficiency and then maximize receipt back to the data center. So if all you're interested in is, say, like um, a a door is open somewhere out on an oil rig. Um, all you need to do is keep beaming that fact into outer space and eventually it'll get through. But I'm interested in a sequence of events uh, and that drove uh, the, the, the build and design of um, what I, I'm trying to do here. So the Canadian constellation currently has eight satellites. It's a, it's a polar orbit. Uh, so this, it goes from the, the bottom of the, the world to the top of the world. And as you can see in this diagram, it actually sweeps across, uh, across the world. So uh, this is over um, a, a number of days and that passes, uh, the, day, the, the position it passes you and the angle it has against you at your transmitter will change over time. So it's quite a large footprint, but it does imply that you need to calculate uh, when to do transmission. Um, so, uh, one of the tools they give you to calculate is the uh, the Canaeus website. So um, I, what you do is you put in a, a start date and an end date um, and then select the lat long. So this is in North Leeds or approximately in North Leeds. And you can see this red dot here on the planet shows you approximately where I am. Um, altitude is, is measured in kilometers. And then you put in an elevation. So if you're at the bottom of a valley, for instance, then that angle would be quite steep. Um, but if you're on a flat plain like an, an open sea, then it'd be quite shallow. So originally I put it as 20 degrees, but one of the Canaeus engineers advised that that was quite limiting. So I've kind of settled on uh, a 10 degree instance. So then it calculates for you. Can you mind if I if I give a, a few compliments while you put you present? I think it's quite important to yeah, understand sure. here that the five thousand footprint is actually a, a good thing here because then you get longer satellite paths. And our our specificity on the on the satellite part on the antenna is that it can receive as well if you are very low above the horizon at zero to five degree, for example, whether you right above you and and this this allows quite a large uh, uh, satellite pass for for the the devices to transmit it's yeah, quite I mean, specific to our technology it's, it's negative it says in the documentation yeah. that the, the the error of margin is about 250 miles so it's about the distance between here and liverpool so quite a good tolerance for uh transmitting messages um, so to look at the, uh, the the passes from today, if we see it's about half six at the moment, you, scat, you see that the next satellite passing over Leeds where I live is MB. The pass will start at 56 minutes past the hour and finish at three minutes, almost four minutes past the hour with a pass time of about seven minutes. And um, then you have a, you, you look at this graph uh, and it's quite difficult to understand, but basically this shows you the passes over the next 20 days. So if you take the um, the SR satellite here, at the beginning, of, like on today, it will have a pass at about 3 a.m. in the morning for, of, of about two minutes. After 10, 10 days time, it will be passing at 5 a.m. and have a pass of 10 minutes. And after 20 days, it will be 7 a.m. and again back to two, two minutes. So what this shows is you really need to be re recalculating when the satellites are passing overhead to ensure you've got effective transmission. 
Um, and the bottom line is, uh, when you take that all into account, uh, here in Leeds, certainly the coverage is about 5% today. So you don't want to be, uh, if you're looking for like itemized telemetry going back to a data center, you want to be sure that there's actually something listening when you're uh, pushing those messages out. Um, so what we have to do basically is calculate passes because there are gaps in coverage and we want to reduce, you might want to reduce energy consumption. So we don't want to be transmitting all the time, uh, you know, a 500 milliwatt, a thousand milliwatt message up, uh, up to the satellites. And can I just give you a number of different tools and able to do that? I've just demoed the website. Uh, it also gives you a Windows tool that runs uh, the, the C code and also C code that you can embed in your device itself. So it can be continuously uh, calculating but when the satellite's going to be passing overhead. All you need is um, uh, a description of the satellites and uh, their positions and how they pass over the Earth. So this is my hardware setup. So originally I started off with an Arduino Uno, but I really found the memory very limiting. Uh, and it couldn't do a lot with it. Uh, so I, I plumped the Arduino Uno Wi-Fi, which uh, I didn't need the Wi-Fi, but the extra memory, it's like four, eight times the memory was uh, useful to get what I wanted to done. This is a data logger board. So I had a memory card here. So each time I was taking a reading every 15 minutes, it'd be logged to that card, which I could then uh, compare with uh, what I received back in my data center. This is a battery for a real-time clock because timing was really important on this. So I couldn't be uh, minutes off, otherwise I'd be potentially missing that satellite as it passed overhead. Uh, this is my useful data. So that's a, a thermometer, which just took the temperature of the air and, and uh, I logged that and passed it back. And then a bit of uh, user interface. So it flashed green when I was uh, taking a reading and flashed red when it was transmitting. So I knew it was doing something useful. So here's a representation of the Kim One demo board with an aerial. Um, here I've got it plugged into the Arduino you know, Wi-Fi, but eventually I gave that a separate power source uh, because an engineer at Canadian said that um, the Arduino you know, might uh, limit the, the current that it's providing uh, and that might uh, reduce my reception. So this is the demo board that I got to play with. Uh, so this is the Canadian chip as already shown. Um, this is the, you can see my board underneath. So there's the SD card of the data logger and the power supply for the Arduino Uno. Got through peripheral devices hanging off here and a separate power supply for the Canaeus chip and the F, uh, and an aerial over here. Got a number of different jumper settings you need to be aware of. So this just can, uh, switches the power supply between uh, the Arduino board and an external one. And this is the jumper settings for transmission and receiving. Uh, one key thing is that you do need um, a, a pretty strong battery or power to to do um, transmission. A, a USB 2 power supply doesn't supply enough power. It needs to be more than 500 milliwatts. Otherwise, you risk uh, seeing some attenuation in the strength of the signal you've got. Um, so this is my test setup. So it's kind of indication uh, of uh, where I live. So this is a sort of north-south uh, situation. This is a, a conservatory. It's all built out of plastic. So a Canadian engineer advised me that this shouldn't attenuate the signal too much. And then I've got a, a shallow roofed extension in the house itself and then trees 20 meters away. Why this is important is because if you've got um, a satellite passing over this side and it's transmitting the house, all the trees blocking the other way might attenuate that signal. But because I adopted a strategy of repeatedly transmitting the same signal, um, I believe that it should have been able to get a transmission through in the majority of cases. So what my software does, um, it's all on GitHub, uh, is it gets a temperature data every 10 to 20 minutes, stores a counter, which is just an integer, and puts it in a stack. It can, uh, I pre-calculate the satellite pass data, so I export from the website that you've just seen and put it into my Arduino code. It uses a real-time clock for accurate transmission times and then it checks every minute. So if there's a satellite passing then it starts transmitting uh, as many readings popped off the stack as it can uh, to the satellite. 
uh, and you, and uh, one key thing is I set the power to a thousand milliwatts. So I think the minimum is about 500 milliwatts. Uh, also, you can set it to 500, 750 milliwatts as well. So the Canaeus payload, so someone asked about bandwidth earlier. Um, what I realized as a web developer is using TCP IP, I've been spoiled my entire life. Um, so I've got 64 bytes total in a, in a single message. Uh, within that, you can send some GPS data. So that, that uh, is the C code to set all of this up. Uh, a reading date, just the day, hour, min. Uh, and this, their code packs it all in as efficiently as it can using bytes, really, bits, uh, really very efficiently. And then comes the user data. So in my case, uh, it was uh, the integer counter and temperature. Uh, and I had a lot of spare there, so I could fit uh, some more data in there if I wanted to. Um, also, you can put some error correction code in here. So uh, a checksum to say, uh, did the message uh, arrive completely correctly? Because sometimes the message came through a bit garbled. And then the BCH, which allows uh, the, the Canaeus data center to um, to correct up to four bits. So if it does get a little bit garbled, it can then reconstitute it using the BCH. Uh, one thing to note is that that's switched off by default. I don't know why it seems like an amazing thing to have just on by default. Uh, but I, I arrived at that sort of about a month ago to put that on. So back on the, the Canaeus website, uh, you can see the data is coming in here. Uh, it shows you the data came in, how long the pass was, the satellite that picked it up, um, the uh, GPS estimated GPS coordinate of the transmitter. I'll be mentioning that briefly later on. Um, and then this is the raw data. So you, you can, it all sort of packs into hex format and then you need to decode it in your data center. Uh, and then this is the BCH status. So the BCH uh, code was meant was meant, uh, able to uh, correct three bits here, and the CRC uh, came through correct. So it shows that it was a successful transmission. So from the from my transmitter, I would set up to one of the uh, Canaeus satellites, which when uh, another thing to know is that the, the, there's a finite time between it, the satellite passing over you and then it reaching a data center potentially on the other side of the world. Um, so that could take you know, between 10 minutes and a couple of hours. It would then pass my uh, from my their data center onto my data center. So I'm, I'm running something called Azure IT Hub. Uh, as soon as it received a message, which was transmitted via MQTT, an Azure function was ready to receive that, decode it, dump the raw message in blob storage, and then decode it into table storage. So what you got back was something that looked a bit like this. This is my raw data. And when you decode that, uh, you take the hex, turn it into integers, and then ASCII characters. You can see the bit that I was interested in. So my counter is 47 here, and it was registering 3.59 degrees centigrade uh, in my conservatory. It must have been a night reading this. So this is my Azure function. As you can see, it's triggered by uh, events coming in from the Azure IoT Hub. Uh, it dumps the, the raw package that it receives into blob storage. So if anything else goes wrong, uh, I've always got that to look to, to see, uh, and improve my process. So uh, unpacks it, saves it to blob storage, um, and then passes it and converts it from hex into ASCII so I can read it out. Uh, there's a big if statement here because uh, the, the format that I was provided at various times during my testing changed. So it all does pretty much the same thing. Yeah. Uh, and then my mission was to compare the number sent to the number received. So what I found was that it takes approximately eight seconds to, to beam out the message. Um, 
and I found that the reception rate, that's the percentage of transmissions sent versus the number that were received, decoded, unpacked and weren't garbled, uh, increased with the number of transmissions. So with one transmission, I got 10%. With two transmissions, I got 24%. Three transmissions, uh, 45%. Uh, I must stress that that's with no error correction. Uh, when I turn the error correction on, um, this is... Uh, it's quite conservative because it actually rejects anything that where it didn't uh, unpack correctly. Uh, so if I'd had more time, I would have uh, put it into expert mode where it just it just sends everything through because often I can pick out the information I want and the regex is undisturbed. The regex can pick out uh, the data I want, even if the rest of the message is a bit garbled. Um, so one of the nice things, some of the satellites, uh, satellites A1 and NK have uh, can do Doppler effect location. So uh, it would it can give you an approximate location of where the transmitter is. So uh, this is where roughly where I am, and this is where it, it thought the transmitter was. So it, I found uh, the observation that it was on average 600 to 800 meters off. Um, so even if you don't transmit a GPS coordinate out with the Canaeus data, it can it can uh, try and find out where you are. So use cases, this is definitely um, occasionally connected. Uh, the aerial needs to be external. Uh, I tried transmitting from within my house. I got very little through. So uh, yeah, a roof or indoors uh, attenuates the signal substantially. It, uh, as, as they mentioned, this isn't uh, a replacement for mobile. This is sort of an adjunct to mobile uh, and work would work well for where scenarios where LTM or NBIOT uh, aren't sufficient. It's a very small data size, 22 bytes plus eight plus GPS coordinates. It is uh, a little bit tolerant of faults. So you've got the CRC and BCH to help you there. Um, there is a relatively slow speed. I was initially transmitting every eight seconds, but then uh, uh, Marianne in the support center told me that uh, I was only allowed to transmit every 30 to 60 seconds. Uh, uh, there is one, uh, just one way messaging, but two way messaging is coming, I believe, in the Kim 2 package next year. Um, I was told you can't use this on airplanes because it can interfere with the airplanes uh, communications. And then you can connect to uh, PC, Arduino or STM32, or just the, the demo board that I've been using anyway. So future developments, um, date and time are important to me. Uh, but it is really packed very efficiently into as few bits as possible. Uh, and I, I'm not so brilliant at uh, bitwise operations. So I'd look to extract the date and time from the message. I'd put the satellite pass calculations on the device uh, and calculate them on the fly rather than me having to uh, preload them for a two or three day period. Uh, it'd be good when Canaeus launch the 25 additional satellites in 2023, give you uh, substantially extra coverage. Uh, and yeah, kin to to receive the messages. Uh, so there's uh, there's my code. You can go and steal my code or critique my C code if you like. Uh, I'm going to put the slides on SlideShare uh, and feel free to ask questions via LinkedIn or Twitter. I have some questions, John. Okay. Uh, so that looks like a fun side project. Um, one watt at 400 megahertz. Is that enough for the satellite to pick it up using an Omni antenna? No, I had lots of conversations about antennas. Um, and they, they said the, um, the, the antenna that's provided with the demo kit is, is sufficient and should meet all your needs. Because uh, I, I thought I could get better reception if I could buy a bigger antenna or have one that I could station outside or on the top of my house and run via a cable. Um, so I, I'm not an expert in aerials uh, by any means, but so maybe uh, Graham or Remy can answer that one. Yeah. So um, basically the link budget depends on so many things. It depends on how far is the satellite, the elevation, the masks around, the, the, the power, obviously, and then the antenna you use. Um, this is why we... We, we test a lot of antenna and we, we kind of qualify them. Uh, the one we give with the demo kit is the one we, we've, we've seen the best performances with. 
Um, I have, I can share my screen and show you a couple of other alternatives. Yeah, sure. um, antennas, for example. It's not come through yet. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So here you, you can see this is internal antenna that you, you would basically just buy the coil and then you can put this on your PCB. Uh, you need to save some space, but uh, uh, this allows for in, internal antenna. This is what we've done in some of our product. And um, basically we have a, a catalog of all these these options that uh, come off the shelf and that allow for very cheap uh, internal antenna because this is typically a, a few dollar, right? So the performance can depend on the antenna, but um, it's usually pretty pretty good choice uh, for for internal antennas. Um, and yes, one watt today with the existing satellite, this is the we say the standard power we recommend uh, with the constellation with the twenty five uh, satellites. Uh, then and we'll be targeting something much lower and, and more in the 200 uh, milliwatts, so let's say five times lower uh, power consumption. So either you, you keep the antenna and you, you, you lower the power or you, you keep the power and you, you use a much smaller antenna, for example. I saw also there was a question on um yeah do you have supply chain issues um yeah. <laughs> we we Are currently have uh for launching that's another question hmm? sorry i mean dependent on russian rockets for launching because you know the no. mars no. <laughs> we'll not talk about that term the show. yeah no we're launching oh. from new zealand <laughs> we're launching with rocket lab for from new zealand because we needed uh, dedicated uh launches so we're launching plane by plane every five satellites uh, on on one uh, launch mission, um, and this will all go through in in, in 2023. And um, on on chipset and modules, we have a lot of stock available today uh, for chipset and for module. And we are securing uh, the, the most strategic components, basically TCXO uh, amplification and, and microcontroller. Uh, so we we have stock today. Yes. Excellent. And Steve Todd again, uh, does the device get an acknowledgement that the message was received? So today, no. Uh, that's what uh, uh, John presented. Then yeah. you, most of the time, you, you need a, a, um, a, a random repetition strategy. Um, we we basically consider, and, and, and John had a, a, a little uh, worse performance uh, in, in his use case, but we, we usually consider that you can get 50 to 70 percent uh, a probability of good transmission uh, when you're outside when you have the, the proper antenna when you're transmitting in one watt um, and this allows you when you you transmit three times uh, to reach higher than 90 percent uh, probability of good transmission so it's fairly good and um, we'll be offering also acknowledged message with kinase but uh, kind of as a premium service for those who need it um, does the schedule for the satellites will be overhead change regularly? Would you have to update your C library on the device? Um, um, if, a, if a satellite drops out of the sky, then yes. But my understanding is you get this sort of flat file that describes the the movements of, of the direction and speed of the satellite. So that's good enough to predict at least a year ahead. Yeah, at least a few months ahead, uh, one year ahead, probably with the Kinis constellation that will be maintained in, into orbit. Um, but the most interesting part is when you have a bidirectional module, the, the satellites, they send a broadcast of the orbital parameter of the whole constellation. So if you're listening to the satellites on the downlink, then you can update yourself uh, the, the orbital parameters. And then if a satellite is off at some point, for an anomaly, then the downlink will, will tell you, the broadcast will tell you the satellite is off and you will stop using it. So it's not an update in the C library. Uh, it's already included in the way the, the satellite pass prediction algorithm behaves. Okay, uh, one thing I wanted to ask is, is, is how much it costs, because I got this uh, device for free, uh, which is great. But let's say I wanted to rent a device for a year or a hundred devices for a year. Um, what sort of cost would that incur? So we're, we're just selling the module and basically 
Uh, maybe Guillaume, you want yeah, to answer this one? <laughs> the, mod yeah. the module in, in large quantities, it's under 20 euro. Huh? Okay. And after the cost is the connectivity. So it will be up to the number of messages that you will send uh, per day. Uh, but the idea is to have a price range between one to 10 euros per month maximum. Is that so for is that pretty cost effective as well? Yeah. Yeah, it's for satellite communication, it's it's effective. Uh, sometimes we have the feedback from IoT developers that it's more expensive compared to Sigfox or LoRa, but the idea is really to use this technology when those communication protocols are not available. Um, mm -hmm. And also a big use case for the technology is this, I would say, alerting strategy. So the idea also for alerting is not maybe to have a monthly subscription, but maybe only uh, uh, only to pay when you need to send an alert. So there might be different strategies regarding the, the pricing. But uh, as Remy uh, mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, the idea is really to have um, devices that will cost uh, around uh, 100, uh, 100 euros. I mean, Sigfox, didn't they go, on, uh, didn't they go insolvent? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No comment. <laughs> no comment. For the moment, yeah. Maybe that's another comment, another conversation not to have. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah. I think. Uh, yeah, I think that's all the questions that have come through. Unless anything pops through um, in the next couple of seconds, guy, that was that was absolutely brilliant. John, great work. I bet you enjoyed that little project. Oh, it's been fun. Yes. Thank you very much to Graham and uh, Remy for giving me the, the chance to play with that. It's, it's been great. Uh, oh, one more p has popped up. How are you uh, soldering skills, uh, John? My soldering skills are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you're is asking, I solder one of those things on. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> his glasses are. Too, his eyes are too old for that, aren't they, John? Um, is it possible to receive messages directly via RF, or do you have to be delivered by uh, via Kines infrastructure? I'm unsure exactly what the question. Uh, so the when it gets to Canaeus data center, it gets you can push it on via AQMP, MQ, no, MQTT, SMTP, and HTTP. Uh, those are the only ways of get then getting it out of the Canaeus data center. Not yes, re yes. RF reading radio frequency for that. I mean, yeah, I, I think means. basically the way the system works is once it's on board the satellite, that it packaged in a very specific way for us to get the data through our ground station and then to our data center facilities and then it can be distributed to the customer so i'd say yes it has to go to this kines infrastructure to be delivered but we offer as many distribution means uh and as conveniently as possible so as you as you you, you saw john it's pretty easy to interface with our http push uh, with azure or with aws or, or other tools I hope this answers Garrett's question. I'm sure it did. <laughs> Gentlemen, that was absolutely brilliant. Really enjoyed that. And we got a smiley oh. face. Is that, oh, hold on. Is that downlink, downlink encrypted? Yes, encrypted. yes. Yes, yeah. I mean, uplink is encrypted to the satellite. And then downlink from satellite to our ground station is even more encrypted. <laughs> You Excellent. cannot hack the satellite if that's the question. <laughs> yeah, and one, one interesting uh, one interesting use case is also for I would say defense uh, use case. So we work with uh, a military to provide also connectivity uh, for their operations. So uh, regarding security, we have different uh, uh, strong uh, tools to ensure that the data is encrypted and uh, that everything is uh, is protected. Excellent. And Gareth says thanks. That answers his question. And uh, Michael, a good presentation and see the potential use cases. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Hey, John, what have we got uh, next month? Uh, so we have Sander coming over from the Netherlands who's going to be talking to us about LoRaWAN and then how to integrate that with an Azure data center. Excellent. Yeah, again, another great show organized by Mr. Staple, uh, the life and soul of IoT North. Um, and John will be appearing on the um, uh, the marketing moving forward as a face. That's always on there. Um, what did uh, Steve Cameron say? Wash hands. Interesting. Um, and on that note, gentlemen, thanks very much. It was great. It was nice to have something a little bit different on here. Um, and uh, on that note, as he's stalling to get to his brand screen, to find the video, to play it out. 
Um, you can tell I'm totally disorganized today. Thanks very much. Look forward to speaking to anyone. If anybody wants to get in touch and um, uh, ask to uh, be on a show, info at iotnorth.uk, um, or you can uh, get in contact through the website as well. Apologies, there has been some issues with the page for streaming the show, but I have fixed it in real time. I was getting 502 and 504 errors, and it was because of the accent on the uh, for um, the URL, uh, but I managed to fix that in real time. So that's now up. So this show is available if you missed it and uh, you want to tell your friends about it, direct them to www.iotnorth.uk forward slash events and you'll find it there, along with two years worth of episodes. Um, so uh, catch them as well. Thanks very much and good night. <laughs>